Thank you so much for being here, Liz. Uh, and you're a perfect advertisement for age reversal. <laughs> I think we should start with a very, uh, you know, difficult test with the audience, which is to guess your age. Uh, <laughs> would you like me to do that? <laughs> oh, I'd like to take a couple more therapies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, as I said, uh, Liz is really at the frontier of this because she's made her own body a uh, laboratory of sciences that have not yet been entirely tested or proven. So before we get into the real efficacy or the veracity of the science, Liz, yeah. I'd like to just start with a more personal story. Sure. Why did you even go down this path, you know, of making yourself a laboratory? What was your trigger? Well, actually, um, one thing that we can reflect on today before I get into my story is that over 110,000 people are dying right now. And those people could potentially be saved by the medicine that my company and other companies are making uh, that outstrips today's technology. So I want you to get that deeply ingrained in your brain, uh, that it's time for a change. But my story is actually um, the mother of necessity, literally. Uh, so in 2011, I started volunteering my time for the advocacy of regenerative medicine. I learned about stem cells and the epigenetics behind them, and I kind of fell in love with the genes that make stem cells different. So all the cells in your bodies have the same genes, but how they're expressed changes what they can do. So I spent ten, two years on that project, and in 2013, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And this was very hard, because not only was my own child sick with a pretty much incurable disease at that time, but I met a bunch of children who were sick, and some that were dying. And what I realized is that all of this medicine that I had read about and learned about that had been in advanced stages of uh, animal models was not translating to you, to my child, to those children. And so that's the beginning of my story. Right. So, you know, I also want to just share that in just a few minutes, we'll also bring on Sanjeev Galande, who's a, you know, genetics expert with Shivnadar University. But we just thought we'll get Liz's story out and then get the scientific conversation on it. Sure. So, uh, Liz, you said that your child was sick, but you then moved on to really looking at age reversal therapies. And there are a bouquet of uh, therapies or, you know, interventions that potentially could reverse age. Uh, George Church, who's on your board and who's a very esteemed geneticist at, yes. at Harvard, who brought down the cost of human genome mapping from $3 billion to $249, you that's know, right. so that's the level of his work. He also says that the science is real, it's mature, it's possible. Uh, it's been done on mice, it's been done on monkeys, but human beings are a completely different order, you know. So tell us, what is the, uh, out of this bouquet of 10, which are the ones that you picked? Why did you go to Columbia to do it? Why did you turn yourself into patient zero? And if it requires 10 or 12 interventions, why pick only two and what were they? Right, so in 2015, two years after my son's diagnosis and after researching the most promising genes that could treat both childhood diseases and biological aging, you're wondering why I shifted. Every company, every gene that my company chooses actually will also treat a childhood disease. And by treating biological aging, we treat the biggest medical unmet need on the planet, therefore expediting these therapies to children. So in 2015, the two most promising gene therapies to treat biological aging were telomerase reverse transcriptase that lengthens the caps at the ends of your chromosomes and folostatin that increases your muscle mass. Um, what these could do for an aging population is create more cellular divisions and more repair within the body. And folostatin can protect you against type 2 diabetes and about three different types of cancer. So we chose those because they were the most mature in evidence. And that's where we started. So today we don't have, when we look at treating aging, we look at the hallmarks of aging and there's 12 different things that are agreed upon scientifically that are happening at the cellular level. We don't yet have a gene for each one of those hallmarks, but the genes that we started with target the most amount. And then of course I went on to do more gene therapies after that in 2020. Right, so I'm, you know, I, uh, there was a bit of reverb, so I don't know if I, 
caught that entirely. But uh, the two things that Liz did take was the telomeres uh, rejuvenation, which is the ends of your uh, gene cells. Yeah, the caps at the ends of the chromosomes that shorten as your cells divide. Right. So you rejuvenated that, and yes. you also took a myostatin inhibitor, yes. which was you know, for muscle control and to rejuvenate that. Right. So the core idea here is not about gene editing, but it's about boosting, uh, expression. You know, boosting therapies, expression of genes, so that you trick the cells into thinking that they're young yes. and it gets, its repair factory kicks in. Yes. Is that the English version of this? <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> correct. Right. So, uh, you know, what was your experience when you took it? You know, telomeres is also what leads to cancer because if you have uninhibited growth, uh, that could potentially be cancerous. So there was real danger in you taking this. What was your first reaction? And you know, how do you actually feel now that you've been taking this? I think this is your third round. Yeah, so when we first looked at telomerase reverse transcriptase, it, like a multitude of genes, is associated with cancer. But the truth is, it's not upregulated in all cancers, and there's sort of a divide in the research. There's the one research that goes and looks at cancer and the vast amount of genes that cancer expresses, and it's one of those. But if you induce telomerase, it seems to protect the organism against cancer. What causes cancer but cells getting old? Short telomeres lead to genomic instability. So we believe that by keeping your telomeres longer, we'll actually be able to, in the long run, prevent cancer. And we showed that in a paper that we published in PNAS, that we had no increased risk of cancer. It was probably one of three or four papers that are now out there on telomerase. But did you, you know, as I said, I'm going to bring Sanjeev on. I'm totally ill-equipped to, uh, you know, discuss the scientific veracity of any of this. But I just want to go with the emotions first. Right. That were you afraid? You know, what what was that experience of taking it? Well, I mean, every day my son has a chronic disease, so. If you read the literature and you realize that at that point we might be able to help 8 billion people, it was kind of we were at the precipice of no return. And when I went to do the gene therapies, we, I did understand that I could die. Um, but I was willing to accept that over today's sick care system. Um, we, we need reform. We need curative medicine. We need pre preventative medicine. Today, people wait until you get sick and they start treating the symptoms of disease. But if we can actually treat the cell at the genetic level, it revolutionizes everything. It changes the state of disease entirely. So how did that feel? Um, it felt like we were being part of history. Um, I can't say that it wasn't scary a little bit, but we were not going to turn back. And we will continue to push forward for everyone on this planet. Um, this, is, this is a mandate, you know? It's not easy to speak in front of a thousand people except for 140,000 people today will die needlessly. And that's 40 million people a year. And these people add value to the world. And, you know, we, we, we listened about AI. I'm here for biological relevance. With one single gene, Clotho, we can increase your IQ by a standard deviation. We've seen this in multiple patients in investigator-led studies out, outside of the US FDA, and we, that's reproducible. We need to be stronger, smarter, faster, and more impervious to disease. And what does that feel like? It feels amazing to be part of that. No matter how that ends for me, I am so happy to be here right now. Right. So, you know, there was a huge controversy when you went to Colombia to take these therapies because Maria Blasco, who was the scientist that really, you know, innovated on this telomeres therapy, she said this is really dangerous, should not be done. You know, uh, Jennifer Doudna, who came up with CRISPR technology, won the Nobel for it. She said that this is really dangerous because you're pushing the science too fast. Uh, you need the regulation. You need but you have a completely different philosophy on it, which is that you feel that those who are at end of life really facing uh, you know, very debilitating diseases, that they should have the right to take these therapies, even if it ends in, you know, uh, in, in death. And there's another statistic which I'd like to share with the audience, actually, that uh, typically it takes $3 billion to turn one molecule into medicine. 
and I think David spoke about the fact that there's a 17-year gap from, uh, you know, from a medicine actually being identified and it reaching the bed. So th there are things on the other side, but you know, what do you respond to the fact that scientists themselves are very uncomfortable with what you did? I think a lot of the scientists were actually excited with what we did. Um, as far as stepping on the toes of people's grants and livelihoods, I can't speak to that. This medicine is for the people. I'm here to fight for their biological freedom. And I won't be stopped because, you know, it might step on the toes of somebody else's industry. These are your genes, you have the right to them, and, and I'm here to make sure that you get them affordably. So, you know, you have a, a, you have a company called BioViva, you know, which mm -hmm. is also uh, backing these particular therapies. Right now, they're very expensive. You know, uh, some other statistic I read actually says it's $3 million to get one injection. I think the one you took is a $250,000. Uh, these are like really, risky therapy still because the science hasn't been proven. Uh, so how do you cope with the ethics of others trying this? You know, you're making yourself a lab uh, and that's a particular kind of courage, a particular kind of motivation which you've shared. And you know, I just want to share with you that Liz is very composed right now, but this particular, you know, trigger of her own son being ill with a disease that possibly the solution already exists but is not available. Uh, when we first spoke, it was her birthday and Liz actually broke down and really cried, though this is, you know, like 13, 15 years since you discovered yeah. uh, that he's not well, but it's still very real for you, you know? It's still very real. I mean, if disease and seeing your loved ones sick, especially your children, doesn't really shatter something inside of you, um, that's questionable. I'm very emotional about this, and I think that that's what the world needs. I, need, I think that we need compassionate leaders now. We need to get away from the sycophants and the, the um, people who are driven by money, and we need to do what's right for the better of the planet. And that's feeling. We need to feel why we're doing these things. But Liz, I'm going to come back to the science of sure. it because we haven't gone enough into that. But Please. I just wanted to ask you again about the ethics of trying this out on others. You know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your take on that? You've, I said you've turned yourself into a lab. That's okay. What about others? So right now, I spend most of my time on BioViva, but I spend about a third of it on regulations. And I actually work on regulations all over the world, trying to get terminally ill patients access to these new medicines. And um, so when you ask me about ethics, of, of, of the ethics of taking an experimental gene therapy, or the ethics of taking a therapy that treats a symptom of your disease that you know that you will die from. You will take that drug and you will die anyway. I mean, I think that this is where we split ethics wide open. What is the right thing to do? We actually have to spearhead new medicine and give people options to take it. What is a clinical trial but an experiment in humans that's sanctioned by a government? People die in clinical trials. So in medical tourism, we have seen zero deaths and zero severe adverse effects. In clinical trials in the US FDA in the last two years, six people have died of known toxic doses of gene therapy. Why did that happen? Because they don't have to have the same oversight as when a doctor and a company take responsibility for the treatment. We need to take responsibility for those treatments and give people access to safe technology, owning what the outcome is for them. I think that's a game changer.